Hello, I'm Eddie Small, I lecture in uh, Creative Writing at the University of Dundee. And we are here today to do an interview with uh, one of our past students on behalf of CURA, the Dundee University Review of the Arts. Um, Claire McCleary, who I'm going to introduce you to, is, as I say, a past student of ours and she's only just been published. And we are here today to talk about her book and hear some of the passages from the book itself. So hello Claire, how are you? Hello Eddie, lovely to be back in the town and Good. to see you again. It's lovely to see you um, and I'm sitting here with a, a real sense of pride because um, we bask in the success that all our students have, but particularly you, because you and I go back quite a long way in, in, in many ways. Um, tell me about this, this book of yours, what's it like to be a published author? What does it have you like when you get the book and it's in your hand? Well, actually, when you get the book, my book's called Cross Purpose and it's a crime duel. So it has two major protagonists um, and it's published by Saraband um, under their contraband imprint, which is their crime imprint. Um, I think, actually, when I finally got the book in my hand, I felt more exhausted than excited. <laughs> in fact, when I got the first copies in a box, um, I had to sit down because I felt absolutely nauseous mm. and I had to sit for a wee while before I could open it because if I hadn't liked the finished cover right. uh, after all those years work I would have been absolutely ill. Well let's start with the cover. How much um, input do you have as first time writer, first time published writer into the cover of the book that you've got from? Well I always assumed that the publisher chose the cover, in fact almost imposed it on you um, but Sarah Hunt, my publisher at Saraband, is not only very savvy, but very thoughtful and very kind to our debut authors. So she first of all came up with two covers to bounce them off me and invited me to go back with feedback. And the first covers were kind of dark blue and a bit kind of muzzy. And as somebody who'd been in business, I wanted really sort of black and red and great big bold letters. So we went back and forth. Sarah asked me to download some covers that I liked. Um, we did come up with one cover with a figure on the on the on it, which I was very again because Lynn Anderson, who's a role model of mine, once said that she didn't describe her protagonist in any great detail because she wanted to leave that to the reader's imagination. Um, so I went the same way, and I'm very happy with the cover that we ended up with because it shows this rather grimy window um, and through the window you can see these multi-story blocks mm -hmm. which is where a lot of the book is set. Okay. So I remember when you came here to start your Master of Letters at the University and I can remember from the very first meeting that you had this, um, you made a declaration that you were here to, pub uh, to become a published author, that was the reason you were here. Yeah. How much pressure did that put on you as a writer? Well, I think I put pressure on myself because I'm very driven. I was driven in business, I'm driven in really everything that I do. So when I came to do the Emlet, I had a window of opportunity when my children went to senior school. And I started off at part-time classes mm -hmm. and then met Kirsty and she egged me on to do the Emlet. But once I knew you could get um, a, a distinction in Emlet, I wanted that as well, so I really set my sights high. And yes, I did drive myself hard because I knew I only had this one year okay. um, of concentrated writing and I really made the most of it. Okay. Driven people tend to have quite single track minds. How well did you take to criticism and comment from Kirsty and others? On this? Um, I found it really, as an older woman and as a woman who is judged perhaps to be relatively successful in the things I've done in life, I found it quite hard being the brownie. But that's life, you know, you, in all kinds of situations you start again at the bottom. Uh, you know, you go through primary school and you're top dog and then suddenly you're, you're first year in senior school and so on through life. So I did, um, on the one hand, I was receptive to criticism and open to everything and eager for everything. Um, on the other hand, I did actually have to button my lip quite a lot. Um, but I now see in retrospect that a lot of the things that Kirsty Gunn said to me for example, at the end of a short story, she would write one more thing 
And I thought, what the hell does she mean? One more thing, you know, I've done it for God's sake. Um, or she would say, make every word count. Well, that was a bit more understandable. And then I actually wrote the first scene of this book um, as part of my first semester's mm -hmm. writing folio. And Kirsty gave me a word of warning, which was that I shouldn't let the diktats of the crime genre um, swallow my voice, mm -hmm. that it was really important to maintain my writing style. So all these bon mots come back at me again and again. That's really interesting. I've read your book, it's a fascinating book. I, I really do like the book. Um, I love the characters in the book. But the story itself, how easy was it for you to plot the whole thing out? Or did you? Um, I think I knew how it started because I knew I was going to write this scene that I wrote in November 2009. Um, I reckoned I knew how it ended. I really hadn't a clue what was going to happen in the middle and this is what Lynn Anderson calls the muddle in the middle. And believe me, it is a muddle. Um, I kind of knew what my plot strands were, but then once you come to an edit, all that goes out the mm. window. Indeed, one of my characters, Zach, who was a godsend in that he was a psychopath, <laughs> my final editor asked me to drop, and I found that really hard. One, because Zach was dear to my heart, I thought he was a wonderful creation, and secondly, because it wasn't just a case of cutting two or three scenes. Mm. You know, he was woven all through the book and I had to take it apart and put it together again. So that was hard. And does hindsight tell you that was a good move? Yes, it did. Right. Right. Um, but having said that, you know, Zach's filed away and he's going to reappear come <laughs> hell and high water. Psychopath returns. You, the, there are many really strong characters in here, but the main two protagonists are Wilma and Maggie, of yes. course. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about Wilma. Wilma. Where she come from? Wilma, um, she's a big girl and big in stature and big hearted. And she comes from Torrey, which is um, on the other side of the river. It's the original fishing village, if you like, for those of you who don't know Aberdeen. And she comes from a big extended family. Mm. And she's a bit kind of rough and ready, a bit coarse, as they say in Aberdeen. And also, she's a bit kind of dodgy. Her extended family are known to the police mm. and so on. And she moves, she's divorced and remarried to this chap called Ian. And she moves into this semi-detached bungalow next door to my other protagonist, Maggie Laird. Right, right. Could you give us a reading now that would bring a sense of these characters are one of these Yes, characters. well, I'd like first of all to introduce you to Maggie, who is my protagonist. And Maggie, unlike Wilma, Maggie is as straight as a die. She comes from really a very narrow, Presbyterian, introverted farming background um, out in the, the agricultural hinterland of, of Aberdeen, near Old Meldrum, um, in a place called Methlick. And she's been married to George, stay-at-home mum, two kids in their teens, and she's very traditional, a conservative, quite unlike Wilma. So the book opens on the day where Maggie Laird's hitherto sheltered and comfortable life falls apart. They stood side by side, not speaking, Maggie barely breathing. When you're ready, Detective Inspector Alan Chisholm indicated the floor length curtains. Maggie watched, her stare unwavering, as the DI drew the curtains apart. Through the glass of the viewing window, she could see the body. It lay in a metal gurney. Maggie had expected a marble slab, a plinth perhaps, something more solid anyhow. She looked down at the uncovered face of the body that lay there. Nothing could have prepared her for that face. It was black and blue all over, mottled here and there with blotches of yellow. The thick dark hair she loved was combed in a parting she didn't recognise. The sharp blue eyes blinkered by ink-stained lids. The facial expression was bland, 
not tortured in its death throes as she'd expected, but flattened somehow, all its humanity stripped out. She stood there for some minutes, rigid, her breath gradually misting the glass. Then, George! Maggie splayed her fingers across the window, let her head fall forward until she could feel her forehead come into contact with the glass. She longed to drum her fists upon its unyielding surface, butt it with her head until it shattered, battle her way through the opening until she could be with him once more. If only she could come up close, hold his hand in hers. Please God, just one last time. That's lovely, Claire, that really is lovely. That smacks of a bit of research in there. I really get the feeling that this writer knows what they're writing about. Tell me the level of research you went to for, for this particular scene, for example. Um, well, I think for this particular scene, a lot of the credit goes to you. Oh, right. um, the reason is that um, we were supposed to have a visit to the dissection room at Life Sciences during the year that I did the Emlet, um, but that didn't happen because of, of circumstances. And you very kindly wangled me an intro on the back of the next year's intake. And that was really a terrific experience. I learned a huge amount. And then also one day my husband was going up to Aberdeen to a meeting and I begged a lift. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he said, well, will I drop you at Mark's thinking maybe going shopping, whatever. And I said, no, no, eh, going to the mortuary, you just drop me around the corner. So I have to say that... Um, the mortuary staff at the Council Mortuary in Aberdeen um, and the pathologist there at the time really were kindness itself. Good, good. It comes through very clearly in the book. And I think that's what makes it such a strong read. You really feel that there's, there's, there's a reality and an authenticity in here that's really strong. The idea of bringing these two women together who haven't done this kind of job before, how does that, how did that come about in your imagination? Um, I think First of all, when I did my research, I read a vast amount of crime writing, mainly Scottish, but also Scandi, Italian, French. Um, and it seemed to me that there were predominantly tortured male detectives with drink problems, divorces behind them, whatever. Um, also a fair smattering of very well qualified forensic scientists. So I really looked to if you like, subvert this. Mm. And my starting premise was, what if somebody wrote a crime novel in which nobody was qualified for anything? And indeed, taking this on, the crime didn't happen. So that's where it started from. So we have a crime book where there's no real crime yes. in it at all, which yes. is hugely interesting. There's a lot of... Um, touching on the drug scene in Aberdeen, yes. the drug scene generally. Tell me about research for that. How do you manage to find out? Um, well, the first thing I would say is I have a mole within <laughs> what is now Police Scotland in Aberdeen. Um, I also have um, a contact with a private investigator in Aberdeen. Um, I had already done some research. I think as a mum, you need to be drug drugs aware, mm -hmm. um, particularly you know when your children are teenage. Um, I think the problem is it's very difficult now to keep up with um, the substances, um, particularly the manufactured substances. So it really is just a case of reading and Googling and, mm. and doing your homework there. Right, right. I love Wilma, I uh -huh. must be honest. Maggie's straight. Wilma's just a, an incredible character. Um, is she mirrored on somebody or, or would you like to read me something that even lets me know more about this yes, Wilma? Yes, she's partly mirrored on somebody. Um, my first business in Aberdeen, um, after I had been an antique dealer for some years, was what was going to be a bistro but turned out to be a poor bee sandwich shop. <laughs> and it actually grew into quite a big catering business. And the, my colleagues there were all then quite young mums like me. Yeah. We all had children at primary school. And when we did a big catering uh, do, like 200 lunch for 200 in an empty office block. I had to say to any, everybody, anybody got a friend, an upstairs neighbour, whoever, and we were just gardener people. And these women were all, um, would have worked part-time if the part-time jobs had been there, um, but they were all to an extent lonely, a wee bit isolated. Um, and these women would turn out for perhaps three hours 
pin money and they were absolutely magnificent and they weren't just waitressing you know they were making decisions on the spot using their initiative so really Wilma is based on is really in tribute to these faceless women who you know lose confidence sometimes when they're at home like Maggie uh -huh. or who are juggling low paid pretty menial part-time jobs like Wilma and have their own mind can you give us another reading now yes. of your choice so this is introducing Wilma so I've told you Wilma's a big girl um, this is a bit later on the same day that Maggie goes to the mortuary and Maggie's had to hasn't had a lot to do with Wilma up until now for one thing as I've said Wilma's a bit rough and ready mm. and to go on with um, because she's a family known to the police, George hasn't been very keen mm -hmm. to develop relations and nor has Wilma's husband Ian. So this is the evening of that day, Wilma and Ian are sitting at their tea and Wilma's saying, poor Maggie Laird, I would really like to support her yeah. and Ian, who's a canny Aberdonian, is urging caution. So this is Ian speaking. I don't think it's a good idea you involving yourself in Maggie Laird's problems. End of. Why not? I just told you why not. And besides, you've your work to go to and there's this house to run. What about the house? Wilma regards her husband with hostile eyes. Is it your dinner that's bothering you? Dinner? Ian looked down at his congealing plate of food. No. The dinner's brawl. Now you're being sarcastic. And you're being daft. Daft now, is it? Wilma? Don't you Wilma me? Oh, Ian came back. There's no arguing with you when you've got a drink in you. Bugger. So he'd smelled it on her. And she'd only had a swallow to steady her nerves. Wilma jumped up from the table. A couple of beers and I've got a drink problem. Wearily. Ian met her eye. That's not what I said. Isn't it? No. Whatever. I'm away to my bed. So then later. Wilma lay in the dark. Her thoughts turned to Maggie Laird, lying on the other side of the party wall. End of, Ian's words resounded in her head. That wasn't like him. He was such a pussycat, her new husband. Ran her to Asda to do the weekly shop, carried the stuff in for her. He was handy round the house and all. Not that they could afford to do much. Not with the mortgage payments. Wilma could set anything down to him as well, and he'd eat it without a murmur. Mind you, he dug his heels in over drawing the bedroom curtains. She'd always preferred them open if, ever since she was a small child. But of course that was because... Forget it, she rebuked herself sharply. Wilma wasn't sure if her husband's preference arose out of modesty. Ian was a bit funny about showing his bits. Or whether he really did sleep better in the dark. Wilma thought it a bit weird, a guy being funny like that about his privates. Still, Ian might be old-fashioned when it came to stripping off, but once she got him going, he was brand new. She heard the toilet flush. Heard the bedroom door open and close. Heard her husband undress. The mattress springs yield as he got into bed. Decisively, she turned her back and slid down under the duvet. For a few minutes, she lay still. Then Wilma felt Ian's arm creep around her waist. She'd already decided he wouldn't be up for it. What with his six o'clock start and the row they'd had over dinner. Now she felt his body mould to hers, his hard on worm its way up the back of her nightie. She uttered a little grunt of satisfaction. No call for Viagra there. Wilma felt a surge of warmth between her thighs. She wouldn't make waves about Maggie Laird. Not yet, anyhow. She'd bide her time. <laughs> well done, that, that's a lovely piece. And what that piece brings to mind for me is this lovely warm narrator's voice for a crime story especially that, that went its way all the way through it but there's a complicity between the narrator and the characters 
almost. Ah, it's there's a real sense that the narrator knows these characters well. Is that something you deliberately play for, or is it just a natural way you write? I think it kind of happened. I, you know, I've been very fortunate in that I've had um, favourable reviews. You know, I've yet to get the stinker and have the nervous breakdown. And uh, one reviewer called the book uh, Tartan Noir Meets Happy Valley. And I think that really encapsulates it because these are two very ordinary, although very different women, thrown together by circumstance. And, you know, they grow and develop together um, and the friendship gels. Mm. Um, but I think really the weird thing about writing is that your characters kind of take you over. Yeah. And the downside is I wake up at five in the morning with dialogue running through my head. <laughs> and sometimes Wilma gets a bit full on and I have to rein her back. And sometimes Maggie gets a bit too uptight and I have to have her loosen up a bit. So I think it's just an instinctive thing. That, that's wonderful, yeah. Let me, let me, people need to buy this book, people need to read this book, it's, it's, it's wonderful. The other thing I want to speak to you is the next book, because I yes. do know that, that um, Sarah Vander have talked to you about doing uh, a yes. sequel, is that yes. the work? Well, how do you feel about that and what pressures does that put on you as writer? Well, I, it, it, the upside is I have a two book deal, mm -hmm. so the second book is hopefully already sold and I don't have to go through the awful, um, you know, touting around trying to find a buyer bit. Um, the downside is, you know, one's publisher has expectations of you and indeed last autumn I was up north for a week which was good thinking time and writing time. And I got an email from Sarah Hunt um, at 10 in the morning. I was actually lying in my bed doing a crossword. And I got this email to say she was giving a presentation next morning to um, reps and to film people. And could I send her the synopsis for the next book and my thoughts on the couple of books after that? Um, and I did have a wee nervous <laughs> breakdown. So I had a synopsis for the second book. But I had to kind of think, oh, because the problem with, I think, a debut novel is you tend to put everything in it. Yeah. And then you think, yeah, well, where do I go from here? Right. Um, happily, I have a pretty fertile imagination. So the next book, Burnout, um, is about domestic abuse. But where the slant on it now is that it's white collar domestic abuse. Okay. So hopefully it's a bit more subtle. Um, and insidious than simply somebody getting a, a doing and yeah. you know ending up in, in Aberdeen in ERI. Mm. Let me finish by asking you the, uh, the last bit of this circle is the life that you now lead. I know you've had several launches. I know you were at Watsons in St Andrews yesterday. You're going up to Watsons in Dundee today or Perth or wherever. What's it like? What, how has this changed your life and is it horrible or is it quite exciting? Um, I think it's a bit of both. Uh, I think publishers now expect a debut author to have an online presence. Um, so there is a bit of a slog of, you know, tweeting um, a couple of times a day and keeping up to date with that, having developing a website, having a Facebook author page, all these things. Um, it is exciting doing events, particularly your launch if you have friends come and it's lovely to see Ken faces in a group or to see a huddle of people who are all avid readers and who've bought your book or potentially could buy your book and have taken time out of their day to come and support you and every writer really appreciates that so it is a bit of a balancing act between the events and then finding time yeah. to write this next yeah. book. Great. Well, you're the latest in a string of people who've been published out of uh, university, and we'd bask in the glory of every one of them, and I'm basking in yours right now. Claire, thank you very much. Thank you, Eddie.